Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today we'll be taking a look at using miniatures for your tabletop role-playing game. I'm a huge fan of using miniatures. I have hundreds of them. Fantasy minis for D&D or Conan, cases and cases of those, 1920s miniatures for Call of Cthulhu, modern and cyberpunk miniatures, sci-fi miniatures that we use for Traveler or Star Wars. Right now we're playing Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blade, so I've started acquiring Wuxia miniatures for that. I've used minis for almost every single system that we've ever Ever played, and my collection has been amassed over the course of 30 years. Now, while I prefer metal miniatures myself, and my players get a kick out of me painting a miniature that they've chosen with whatever colors that they've chosen that they want it to be, uh, that way it's their character's miniature, and even years later we might pick up that same painted miniature, and you might still refer to it as that character that we had long ago, uh, you don't actually need metal miniatures for this. You don't even need to paint them. Painting minis is a separate hobby itself. Now you can get plastic ones or custom 3D printed ones from Hero Forge or the like, or just simply cardboard standees like these from the Cyberpunk Red Starter set, or these paper cut out and fold ones like these from 1980's Call of Cthulhu set. You can even use Lego miniatures if you want, or Little Green Army Men. Whatever you use isn't critical. The big things that I recommend for it though is that the miniatures themselves are not too big. My preference is about 25 to 28 millimeters. Uh, the larger the miniature, the smaller the relative board is in comparison to them, and since I like doing huge cavernous rooms or large backdrops, I prefer using smaller miniatures, that way we can afford to have a, a much larger map. Now, for player characters, they should have a front and a back, a direction that the character is facing. So with paper cardboard standees, or maybe the same image has been printed on both the front and the back, uh, you might need to mark them or their stand in some way, that way you can differentiate which way they're facing. Uh, such as these cyberpunk ones have the same image on the front and back, but they denote which way is the front and back. Now, one of the big debates that happens in the RPG community is using miniatures versus playing theater of the mind. And this debate can get weird heated, and I've heard a good number of ridiculous claims of why strictly being theater of the mind is the superior way, uh, that I've actually become a bit turned off by that term now just due to uh, the way a very small but very vocal few pretentiously throw that term around. It just kind of causes my eye to twitch whenever I hear it, uh, which stinks because I think it's a really cool sounding term. I actually love the sound of it. Miniatures, ignoring the fact that they can be fun to collect and fun to paint, are simply tools. And a game master should use whatever tools are best for enhancing their game. So let me go through a few of the ways that my players and I have used miniatures because there's evidently a lot of weird misconceptions about them. First, we don't use them in every scene. If the characters are wandering around, visiting shops, researching things in the library, we don't slow the game down to draw this out and place miniatures on the board. Uh, small encounters that only have one or two bad guys, we don't halt the momentum of the game to stop and draw everything out and place miniatures on the table if we don't have to, we just simply theater the mind it. And if the minis in the board do not enhance the scene, then simply don't use them. It's not an all or none thing, it's just simply case by case when you choose to use them. Uh, we've regularly gone full sessions where the characters' minis that might just be sitting on the edge of the table, ready to be used at a moment's notice, but not getting used at all that session. We just had them in case we needed them. Now, sometimes we might be playing a scene or a special placement is important for whatever reasons, such as uh, where the table is in the room in relation to the door and the windows, or maybe the room really isn't of a conventional shape, and it's a little bit harder for the player to visualize it, and they say, could you draw this out for me? I'm having trouble seeing it. In which case, I'll quickly sketch out the location on the board. That way the player and I are on the same page as far as what the layout is and avoiding any confusion of, oh, I thought the door was on the other side or whatnot. And now the player can focus all of their brain power on the important stuff, such as solving whatever the problem is at hand, without having to waste all that mental energy of just trying to grasp whatever the basic layout is. Essentially, we're allowing our imaginations to paint the room rather than using up all our brain power trying to map the room. And then if we need to, we can add miniatures, but more often than not, all we need is just the basic layout of whatever the place is. Next, the grid is more for me than it is for the players. Some games might require a grid for very precise ranges and movement, and if we need to use the grid in that way, if we absolutely have to, then we will. Now, years ago, this was something that I really, really cared about. Uh, the, the difficulty of you know, the target, maybe if they're five meters away, is different than it is if they're four. We'd count out the individual 
individual squares and determine exactly how far everybody was from each other. But I think the last time we really did that was like 2014 or sometime. So it's been a while since we've even used the board in that way and really used the hexes in that way. Most of the time, the squares on the mat are ignored. I mostly use them to keep my lines relatively straight whenever I'm drawing something on the board. And the scale of what I'm drawing might mean that uh, one inch could be three feet or five feet, maybe eight, maybe 15, depending on however large the, the room is or wherever it is that they are. And most of the time, I try not to answer the questions to my players of how big a single individual square might represent unless it really, really matters. Dodd, it's your turn. How far is it to the altar? What is it you're wanting to do? Okay, so if I do a flat out run, can I make it behind it? How far can you move it around? Uh, I can make it 40 yards. And I can get 30, because I'm going to be following once it's my turn. That's like 14 squares there. Ain't no way you guys are going to make it. Nah, Todd can spurn across the room and leap behind it, barely making it in time. But Dweebles, you're a little bit slower, so there's still going to be a few yards between you and the cover of the altar by the end of the turn. My players don't mind at all that our distances in the game might be a little bit squishy as long as they're consistently squishy. Uh, consistency is really the key to being a game master, but just because your board came with you know, hexes or squares that have been pre-printed on it doesn't mean that you have to use use them. Just use them when and how whatever it is that you need to. This is the same reason whenever I'm running a game on a virtual tabletop like Roll20 or whatnot, the first thing that I do is I disable the grid. That way we don't have to deal with it. But the biggest way that we use miniatures, and we always have, is to remember character placement. If the characters are exploring a haunted house and we split up and we move the miniatures around to whichever rooms the characters are in, and it helps all of us remember you know, who is where and who is with whom. When dungeon crawling or exploring some location, even if we're not mapping all the dungeon out and everything as we go, you know, we might just draw a single hallway and line the miniatures up in marching order, that way we know what the marching order is. Uh, that way when something happens, like a trap or an ambush, there's no confusion or debate as to you know, who was where in relation to one another. Now, speaking of dungeon crawling, maps are great whenever a trap goes off. I'm going to open up that chest. The chest explodes, and each of you takes 15 points of damage. But I was across the room looking at the tapestry. Oh, yeah, I do remember you mentioning that. And I never entered the room. Oh, well, I thought you had. Haha, oh, no way. Guess I'm safe then. Having miniatures in those situations really does cut down the confusion and the debates. I'm going to open up that chest. The chest explodes, and you and Todd take 15 points of damage. But Dweebles is over by the tapestry, so he was safely out of range. Um, I never entered the room. You set your mini beside the chest, though. Oh, yeah. Maybe if it healed 15 points, you'd remember standing by it. For some of the more elaborate traps, miniatures are great for knowing exactly where everybody is. As you lift the lid from the casket, bolts of lightning come shooting out and hitting Mike. Damn, I never make my traps roll. Did it hit me? Because I'm standing like 10 feet behind him. And I'm off in the back where it's safe. Electricity arcs between the pillars of the room, hitting anyone in its path. Dweebles, you're safe. But Todd, your miniature's in the path there, so you're going to have to make a saving throw. Damn it! Because of this, I make my players responsible for where their miniature is on the board. Now, of course, the Game Master is always going to have veto power here, but unless there's a reason that the Game Master needs to be vetoing wherever the uh, player character is on the board, whenever some event happens, we just simply go by wherever the miniatures are. And it makes the players really attentive to where their miniature is on the board because they don't want to have their miniature somewhere that might get them in trouble if some sort of trap goes off. But the biggest help that miniatures gives us is it helps us track combat. You know, heroes are exploring a forgotten temple and suddenly they're attacked by bad guys. One player has one, another has two bad guys on them, and one of them ended up with four bad guys on them. Being able to see who is outnumbered or who is down and needs help can really cut down on the confusion during a combat scene. It not only helps the players figure out whatever it is they want to do their turn, you know, visually see whatever the situation is and making informed decisions based off that, but it really helps me as the game master, you know, kind of track, you know, which bad guy is attacking who, who should be getting bonus bonuses for overwhelming or flanking or that I'm not forgetting anything and having some bad guy just kind of accidentally teleport from one PC to another and attack the wrong PC. I have played in many pure theater of the mind games under some amazing game masters, and those were some awesome games. But when combat happened, especially combat with multiple opponents, it quickly became confusing as hell. With you know, where is the bad guy? I thought they were over here. The game master forgetting to give all the NPCs their turn, or countless little errors that either slowed the game down as we were uh, having to pause and try to clarify things, or were making mistakes because we forgot that you know this person was being overwhelmed, or this person had been knocked over and was 
unconscious, and all of that could have easily solved with just a simple visual representation of what was going on. So that's it for why miniatures are a great tool. Let's get to some tips and preferences that I personally have on using miniatures. First, you are not going to have the perfect miniature for absolutely everything in your game, so don't even try to worry about that. I own one D&D troll miniature, so if I run an encounter where there's three trolls, I'm going to use something else to represent the other two trolls. I might just say like, hey, they look like this first one here, but there's the other two. The miniature does not have to look exactly like the character or the creature that it represents. I mean, it's cool if it does, but I'm more concerned that the size of the miniature is appropriate for whatever the size of the, uh, the creature or the person is in relation to the other PCs. Now, in a pinch, if we've got something like a big horde of kobolds, we might just simply use dice to represent the individual ones. You know, uh, uh, the green dice, one through six, you know, or then the white dice, one through six, just to be able to identify them. You know, when the players are attacking, they'll be like, hey, I'm going to go for green number four there. That way we all know which one it is, and I can kind of keep track of that on my paper there. A lot of horror game masters, especially Call of Cthulhu game masters that I encounter, they say that they don't use miniatures in their game because indescribable horror being ruined by a simple piece of plastic that's on the table, which I find that to be a really silly argument myself because I, you know, my players, they use miniatures and they're pretty used to the fact that they still have to visualize the monster itself. You know, after all, the mapping out the room and they just see a couple black lines representing a box, they can still visualize what the room looks like. So even if the miniature is an accurate depiction of whatever this monster physically looks like, it's not going to be able to capture the way this monster moves and sounds, the smells that it's making. Those are all the game master's job to describe and really plant that image in your player's head. So I see it if the monster, just having a miniature of the monster on the table removes the horror from the situation, then the game master really wasn't describing anything. Next, before a session begins, go ahead and pull out all the miniatures that you're expecting to use during that particular game. You know, keep them behind your screen or in some prep zone somewhere within arm's reach of yourself. Uh, that way, when you need the miniature, it's just right there. You don't have to stop anything thing and grab it. And if you end up in a situation where the players might go somewhere you weren't anticipating or might do something you weren't expecting at all, and they encounter some sort of person or some sort of monster and you don't have a miniature for it, and you're like, oh my god, I've got the perfect miniature for this, and I just need to get it out of my case or out of the other room, ask yourself, is that going to be worth it to slow the game down, to dig in the case, or go to the other room? And it's almost never worth it to slow the game down. So pull out whatever it is you want to use before the game begins. And if it ends up in a situation that you might need to pull out another miniature, you probably don't need to pull out the other miniature. Just make do with whatever it is you have. Because I have a lot of cases for my fantasy miniatures, I also have this small one, which is specifically for player characters for wherever our campaign is. And that way they're not going to be scattered around you know, three or four other cases that I have to dig through every game. Next, have a means of identifying characters who might be flying or invisible or in some way different. You can elevate them up on a flight stand or in a plastic box that your dice came in or simply a plastic cup if you have one. Now some people use those uh, plastic pizza saver things for this, the ones that look like little tables, or you can just simply stack a die under the miniature, you know, something that at a glance shows that that particular character is uh, elevated up on a catwalk or up in a tree or somewhere above the same plane as everybody else. Uh, you can also simply put a coin or a token or just a colored piece of paper underneath a miniature to represent that uh, that character is under the effect of a long-term spell or condition, like they're invisible or they're on fire. And that shows that, yeah, they're still in the same plane as everybody else, but it also gives a visual reminder that something special is going on there. Now with miniatures, if you're going to be going for metal or resins or some that require a little bit of assembly, you know, having a lot of delicate little glue-on parts, you know, their arms, their legs, their weapons in their hands, their you know, different appendages, you might be able to swap them out for different ones. You know, this one right here, it, both of its coattails are individually glued on, as is that lifted arm, and I am not a fan of these type of miniatures. Yeah, they look great, but I prefer my miniatures to be one solid piece. Reason being is that glued parts you know, come weak points on the miniature, and we put our miniatures through a lot of wear and tear as we use them, as they're regularly getting picked up and moved around the table, laid on their side to represent that they're dead or unconscious, and all those little glue points can cause weak points where that miniature can break and ends up uh, becoming just a little mess, and now you got to repaint it because all the, that paint along that part has been destroyed. A lot of people love customizing you know, their miniatures, you know, maybe sawing off perfectly good arms and legs and swapping them out with something else, and, you know, adding all sorts of gear to them to represent what all it is that their personal loadout is but 
I'm not one of those people. I don't like doing that. Modern working minis ain't show minis. The last several years, miniatures have started using less of the, the molded on bases, opting instead for slotted plastic ones that you glue on. I assume it's for cost because, you know, plastic costs less than metal. The problem that I had with them is that many of the companies, uh, Reaper is extremely guilty of this, give us these huge 30 millimeter stands, which because I store and transport my miniatures in cases, those stands are so wide that the miniature actually has trouble fitting in it. Like you can't even close the lid to the case because the, the stand sticks up so high. So I pick up smaller bases, uh, 25 and 20 millimeter bases, and I use the smallest one that that particular miniature might be able to fit. And I'm going to link down a video description below if you want to pick some of those up. I highly recommend them because I really, really freaking hate those giant bases that they give them. Finally, for all those out there who do paint their miniatures, one tip that I strongly recommend is when you paint them, put a date on the bottom of it. It might sound silly, but in a few years, when you pull that miniature out and you see that date from 10 years before, it is pretty cool. I started doing this in 2000, and it's really fun to see that date and reminisce about what adventure or whatever campaign it was that you painted it for, so future you will appreciate it if you do this. Anyway, that is it for the miniatures video. Hopefully it might dispel some of that mindset that using miniatures instantly requires, you know, hours and hours of time mapping out each and every scene or meticulously counting squares whenever a combat happens, like as a tactical war game, as if uh, using miniatures is all or none. Sometimes miniatures can enhance the games, other times not. And if they don't enhance it, simply don't use it. And if you are somebody that uses miniatures, hopefully you found a new idea or whatnot of how to employ the miniatures in your game. Till next time gamers, have a great day.